as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. Spirit yield. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship Thee. You're my friend, and you are my brother, even though you. I love you more than any other, so much more than anything. You alone are my strength, my shield. To you alone may my spirit my heart's desire and I long to worship thee and I long to worship thee Hallelujah dear Praise the Lord Amen and welcome to this Saturday evening Bible study Amen. And what you a know, lovely song. It's you know, sound. Lindsay, we're in very serious days, and we've been warning to our other Jesus course of these, and it's now manifesting in the news. Mm. Let me say that what we're witnessing in Britain, and I suspect in the United States, are the same conditions they experienced in what became the Soviet Union in Russia of a Marxist revolution which has no tolerance for anything but the state and for many years well going back to the 1920s Rees House warned of the Roman Catholic Church taking premises near to our colleges and universities mm. and the Roman Catholic Church ideology is akin to Marxism, hence the offshoots in liberation theology in South America. Mm -hmm. And our program after program after program has been warning of this a long, long time. And I've had a word from the Lord. Now, first of all, he's coming soon. He's not taking, telling me the hour of the day. But I believe that we have only two years to get this word out when the suppression on the gospel will be so great either the kingdom of the antichrist i believe the rapture will be before then and we have warned people over and over again and many times it seems it's going on deaf ears mm. look around you the bible says the oh. signs of the times there'll be pestilences are there pestilences are there famines? Are there earthquakes? All of these things are happening at a greater pace than ever before. And there is an agenda. And we talked about it on the Coppite Church this morning. We care about all lives. Black lives, white lives, equal opportunity, all of this. But there's an agenda where we read Black Lives Matter. On the outset, that looks great, but there's an underlie behind mm. it. And it is a Marxism and a Marxist takeover. They are one spokesman I heard on talk radio with Mike Graham, who's an excellent presenter. He admitted he wants to do away with the police, defund the police. He was looking for a Marxist 
overturn, a revolution. Mm. Exactly what was going on in Soviet Russia. I'm telling you, unless there's a return to the old Bible, you see, the new Bibles are really a manifestation of Marxism, which came out all those years ago in Alexandria, Egypt. And we're going through that tonight. And next week we'll be going in depth at these, what we can call Marxist Bibles, in effect. Like the Alpha Course, in my view, is Marxist, not Christian. And it's not long now till the Lord comes. I can't tell you the hour and the date. But the signs of the times are there. And so what we're dealing with in the other Jesus course is life and death, quite frankly. And my appeal is that people get to know it. And, and, and our subject, our part two, how Egypt embraced itself into Rome is so important. Thank you, Lindsay. Amen. We confess we're tired today. <laughs> Lindsay and I... We have many programs at the weekend, but we're going to stick with it because the hour is such. And I'm going to quote Charles Fuller. Charles Fuller was the founder of the Fuller Seminary, whose seminary was taken over by the New World Order from people who believed in a universalism, in a socialism, in something that was not the gospel his own son Daniel going to Karl Barth in Switzerland, bringing back a new theology, which has brought in a set of rules in relation to Eastern mysticism and business, which has taken over most of the church operations of this world. And I feel it right just to quote the original Charles Fuller. He says this, I keep asking myself what is the greatest need and how best to meet that need. And the answer came back. He's hearing from the Lord here. The greatest need is to send out Holy Spirit-empowered men. And he's talking men and women before we start kicking off. It's a mankind scenario. Men in whom the Word of God dwells richly and that's the inerrant word and the inerrant word is what's missing and these programs these meetings these services whatever you want to call them we do online with very small audiences although the lord is going to have me shortly spend a long time setting up target facebook uh pages so we can send them out into specific areas all over the world because it's important the world gets to know this. We are dealing with a church which has been taken over by Marxism, frankly. When Brian Mason and I went to Karl Marx's grave, Highgate Cemetery, the highest natural point above London, significant, all around his grave was the Egyptian Ankh, which of course is associated with Constantine, who we've been studying on this Saturday night Bible study in relation to the Apostle Paul warning of another Jesus. He didn't see the cross of Calvary in his vision. He saw the Egyptian Ankh. That's all around Karl Marx's grave. Lindsay and I have suffered a great deal over the years by those who've targeted us by the Marxist form of so-called Christianity of the Ankh rather than the cross of Calvary. The radio preacher reports Paul Smith, our, our favorite book at the moment, New Evangelicalism by Paul Smith. He, he says this, the radio preacher preferred to stay in the background at the seminary, but when he spoke in chapel for the first time, his message rang with the fundamentalist tones of his 32 years experience in the ministry. He continued, this is Charles Fuller. We are no doubt in the closing hours of the church age, which is what I've just been saying. 
The greatest need of the hour is to send out trained men, but not those with just head knowledge. The key is to be sanctified, consecrated, and cleansed. To be a spirit-filled, controlled, empowered, true witness for Christ. What an awesome statement. It's what we are here fundamentally to do. We're calling more students to come and train with us. We're having a full-time student, worker, uh, uh, help with everything person. We share things out here, the work that needs to be done. Come and join us shortly from Yorkshire. And we're looking for more to come and join us. To be sanctified, consecrated and cleansed is the order of the day. Now we're just a minority, we're just a remnant. But God has got his hand on us. Paul Smith concludes this passage referring to Dr. Fuller saying, An all-important theme in the holiness tradition that had contributed much to fundamentalism was spiritual cleansing. Dr. Fuller devoted the bulk of his address to an exposition of Leviticus 14. We've done this many times as well, which describes Old Testament regulation for cleansing infectious diseases. It's namely referring to the leper. We've done this many times. And that atonement was made for the leper. I believe we're on the verge of seeing a Russian Marxist style. I'm not talking Putin Russia, I'm talking the the Russia of the revolution, of Stalinism. I believe we're on the verge of it in Britain in America. And that the new world order is of a Stalinist regime which gives little tolerance for different views, different opinions and different passions. And that political correctness has been brought in as a precursor for this. The certain things we're not allowed to preach on. On the transgender debate, on the homosexuality debate. We're not allowed to talk about that already. We're not allowed to give God's perspective. You can read it for yourself, but we're not allowed to give it. We're dealing in the end times, as Dr. Fuller stated. I believe you need to get a hold of what we're saying in these programs. Now, even though we're tired, even though Lindsay and I are working all the hours of the day and night, there's times we chill out at night and uh, we like to watch wholesome programs, we like travel programs, we like to look at God's creation. And are blessed by watching many of these with Bill Nighy, uh, Chris Tarrant, um, Tony Robinson, um, and so forth. Others as well. Michael Portillo. Look, holiness is about living the life all the time. That doesn't mean being a religious freak, anything but. We can appreciate God's creation. We appreciate living in one of the most beautiful parts of the world and living on a main street which is a conservation area. It's a beautiful street with old houses. Our studio here is 200 years old. And we've been brought here by the Lord with lovely people who have in to a certain degree being protected from this Marxist takeover because they're farming folk and fishing folk. And I was touched by, who is that wonderful guy with the long hair like me? Davy Brown. Davy Brown. Brown. Brown is, is an old Mission Hall man, the man who came on talk radio to talk of universities. Oh, sorry, the other one. Neil Oliver. Sorry. He said this on talk radio this week. He said, don't go to university. Get yourselves a job and buy books and study yourselves. He has seen the Marxists take over the education system. 
We ourselves have a grandson. Look, Lindsay and I have no money of our own. When I say have no money, yeah, you'll see us go to the shop. I'm talking about money like um, savings and all that kind of thing. And, and like Paul, we say we, the loss of everything. We've had that many legal actions taken against us. We're basically skint in our old age. Except our old age has become a young age because God's promised in Psalm 103. And we're fulfilling his call. But he's given us this seven-year plan of which there's two years left. I believe that's the end of the age of which we know it. Now, I'm not saying that will be exactly the day Jesus comes back before you all start jumping on me with the scripture. No one knows the hour of the day. But what the Lord did tell us to do was to look for the signs of the times. And I'm declaring his coming is imminent. And I'm telling you this. We need people prepared to lay everything down to come here and join us in these final two years. Now, should the Lord tarry and not hit, we will continue the ministry. And hear from God and act accordingly. But we've been given these seven years for a major outreach to reach every creature with the gospel. To achieve this, we have had to expose what has come in and the evil thereof. And our subject today, how Egypt, we're talking spiritual Egypt before everybody thinks we're being racist against Egypt. We're talking spiritual Egypt going back to the pyramids and the pharaohs who held even Egyptian people in bondage. So don't take it the wrong way. You've got to be so careful nowadays. That people are unable to give things into context. And we're going to cover over this week and next week the history of these new Bibles which have their Alexandrian origin. But it's as if everyone's been bewitched. It's easy to prove all of this. Not difficult. But as Paul said to the Galatians, O oh foolish Galatians, who have bewitched you? They weren't hearing what he was saying, Lindsay. That ye should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ had been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only what I learned of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, ye now made perfect by the flesh? And we have said many times on our programs of the Nestle Alain Committee, the Vatican and the Bible Society is coming together to revise Bible after Bible, different doctrines, every edition brought such an instability. We saw it at the Elam Bible College. Let me tell you, probably the greatest evil I saw in my life, the undermining of the vision of George Jeffries, and more importantly, the undermining of the true word of God. Those of you who have our notes, page 45 of our part 5 of our Other Jesus course, dealing with the two main codices of the new translations, codices Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. Vaticanus, who knows why, is referred to in theological circles simply as B. So we're dealing with Vaticanus B. And this Vaticanus Codex has been greatly worshipped by modern scholars. It's catalogued into the Vatican in 1475 in excellent physical condition, being written on excellent vellum. Now, there's no dispute. It's a simple fact that new translations have their origins here. And to us, it's incredible, the Protestant churches, Luther himself having a translated uh, Textus Receptus into German, that those following the Lutheran clan should then embrace Vaticanus above what Luther embraced. So those who are controlling the Bibles 
is the same grouping that has brought severe persecution against Christians since the very inception of the Roman Catholic Church, even going back to the days of Constantine. I looked up in a dictionary the meaning of Vatican, and it literally means place of divination or place of sorcery. Put it in your microphone. Lindsay's the, the Latin scholar. Coming She's from me. Come on. Um, the Latin word for a seer or a diviner or soothsayer is vates, V A T E S. Mm -hmm. That's where it comes from. That's it. Always use your microphone, Lindsay. The Vatican, with its association with the Bible Society, has been highly successful in bringing Egyptian Bibles. They're used here in the Kirk here which would once upon a time be known as a Protestant church. It still waves the Union flag. It's people mesmerized by these false scriptures. They use and practically everybody else. Only the remnants is now using Textus Receptus. It's so sad. Why would Christians want to be involved with a codex coming from the place of sorcery called Vaticanus and is indeed sorcery itself. The true Bible declares, when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. All of this the Vatican does. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. Because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. I read too online about Codex Vaticanus. It's described as one of the most important manuscripts for textual criticism is a leading member of the Alexandrian text type, heavily used by Westcott and Hort, probably the main codex alongside Sinaticus and Alexandrinus. In what they called their original Greek of 1881. Now, Lindsay is a teacher of ancient Greek. So we learn from Westcott and Hort that Greek began in 1881, Lindsay. Is, is this a new revelation for you? Use your microphone if you're going to speak. Who are they to say what the original <laughs> Greek was? <laughs> oh, there you go. Uh, Lindsay is a, a, a classic scholar, so it, it, the whole concept of this is just hilarious to her, if it wasn't so tragic. Now, David Cloud described the Vatican setting that is home for Codex Vaticanus, and he questioned as to whether God would keep his preserved word under the Egyptian obelisk of pagan Rome. David Cloud wrote this. He said, The home of Codex Vaticanus is unholy. Certainly not the place one would expect to find the preserved word of God. I toured the Vatican in 1992 and again in 2003, again in 2005, as was astounded as how pagan the place is. Reminds me of the many idolatrous temples we have visited during our years of missionary work in Asia. Fitting to the home of the man who claims the titles and positions of Jesus Christ, who accepts adulation, the Vatican's a monument to idolatry and blasphemy and man's shameless rebellion to God's revelation. There are statues and paintings of all sorts of pagan gods and goddesses. There are statues of Mary and the popes and the saints, so-called, and angels and the infant Jesus and crucifixes. 
The Vatican Library contains large paintings of Isis and Mercury. The Cathedral Petri or Chair of Peter, Peter contains wood carvings that represent the labours of Hercules. And the massive obelisk in the centre of St. Peter's Piazza hails from Egypt and is a pagan object. Now near the main altar of St. Peter's is a bronze statue apparently of Peter sitting in a chair. It's reported this statue was originally the pagan god Jupiter that was taken from the Parthenon in Rome. The Pantheon. Pantheon. Parthenon. Where's the Parthenon? That's in Athens. If you've got a Greek scholar next to you, you'll get put right. The Pantheon in Rome, when it was a pagan temple. Lindsay, was the Pantheon a pagan temple? Yes, it was. It was built in the reign of the Emperor Augustus um, by Agrippa, a dome-shaped building, and it was dedicated. The Pantheon means all the gods. It was dedicated to the 12 main gods of Roman religion. Yeah, they moved it into St. Peter's Basilica and renamed it Peter. Now, Jupiter, this is David Cloud, Lindsay has preempted this, was one of the chief gods of ancient Rome, was called the Pater, or Father, in Latin. And one foot of the statue is made of silver, and Catholic pilgrims superstitiously touch or kiss it. In fact, the Vatican is one gigantic idol. The great altar over the supposed tomb of St. Peter is overwhelmed by massive golden spiraling columns that look like coiling serpents. I believe we're dealing not with the seat of Peter, but the very seat on earth of Satan himself. I believe this is the seat of the Antichrist responsible for what we're witnessing all over the world at this time as the preemptor to the times which are to come, the times of the Antichrist. Continues David Cloud, one can almost hear the sinister hiss. The Vatican is also a graveyard. Beneath St. Peter's Basilica are rows of marble caskets containing dead popes. Life-size statue of each pope is carved in marble, reclines on the lid of his casket, candles and incense are burning profusely. And in the supposed tomb of Peter, 99 oil lamps are kept burning day and night. For those familiar with pagan religions such as Hinduism and Buddhism, the origin of such things is obvious. Place is an eerie and pagan as any temple in darkest India. Pitifully, continues David Cloud, Deluded Catholics light their pagan candles in a vain attempt to merit God's blessing after the fashion of benighted Hindus. There's no biblical authority for any of us. The Lord Jesus warned the Pharisees, For well ye reject the commandments of God, ye may keep your own tradition, from Mark 7, 9. The Vatican is one of the last places on earth one would expect to find the preserved word of God. Yeah. Yet it's Vaticanus, which is being preached and taught here in the Kirk at Whithorn. Vaticanus taught throughout Elam in my years at Elam Bible College, in the Assemblies of God, in the Apostolic Church, in Baptist churches. Mm. It is coming from the seat of the devil himself. I have no doubt in declaring that this is the present day house of Antichrist. The house of Vaticanus situated beneath an Egyptian obelisk. Vaticanus being the main codex behind Nestle land. The follow on from Westcott and Hort's critical agenda. Then we deal with Codex A as it's called Sinaiticus which contains an apparent New Testament an Apocrypha, plus other two other false books known as the Shepherd of Hermes and the Epistle of Barnabas. This ludicrous piece of writing omits, like Vaticanus, Mark 16, 9-20, which we find omitted likewise in the NIV, incidentally. 
declares that signs confirm the pure word, but Sinaticus is far from pure. New translations commonly through the work of Nestle Aland follow this nonsensical codex as they do Vaticanus with its numerous mistakes and erasures. Dean Bergen declared this on many occasions 10, 20, 30, 40 words are dropped. Letters and words, even whole sentences, are frequently written twice over or begun and immediately cancelled while they while that gross blunder wherein, whereby a clause is omitted because it happens to end in the same words as the clause preceding occurs no less than 115 times in the New Testament. For modern scholars to use such corrupt manuscripts in new translations, it is an overall worldwide plot to bring a form of Marxism into the world, universities in all subjects being taken over by this plot. But the greatest plot of all was to remove what is described in the British Constitution as the lively oracles of God from all education establishments. In a summary about Vaticanus and Sinaticus, James Melton wrote this, when someone corrects the King James Bible with more authoritative manuscripts, all as they described older manuscripts, all as they described the best authorities, they're usually making some reference to Sinaticus or Vaticanus. These are two very corrupt 4th century unseals that are practically worshipped by modern scholars. I witnessed this at the Elam Bible College. These are the <coughs> primary manuscripts that Westcott and Hort relied so heavily on when constructing their Greek text, 1851 to 1871, on which all new translations are based, and I include the New King James. Vaticanus B is the most worshipped. This manuscript was officially catalogued in the Vatican Library in 1475, still the property of the Vatican today. Sinaticus Aleph was discovered in a trash can at St. Catherine's Monastery on Mount Sinai by Count Tischendorf, a German scholar in the year 1844. Both B and Aleph are Roman Catholic manuscripts. Remember that you might also familiarize yourself with the following facts. 1. Both manuscripts contain the Apocrypha as part of the Old Testament. 2. Tischendorf, who had seen both manuscripts, believed they were written by the same man, possibly Eusebius of Caesarea, 260 to 340 AD. In other words, they were later than the Antioch line. Vaticanus was available to the King James translators but God gave them sense enough to ignore it, and they did. 4. Vaticanus omits Genesis 1, 1 and 28, Psalm 106 to 138, Matthew 16, 2 to 3, and Romans 16, 24. Also omits 1 Timothy through Titus and the entire book of Revelation and it conveniently ends the book of Hebrews at Hebrews 9.14. And if you're familiar with Hebrews 10, you will understand why. While adding the epistle of Barnabas and the shepherd of Hermes to the New Testament, Sinaticus omits John 5.4, 8.1-11, Matthew 16.2-3, Romans 16.24, Mark 16, 9 to 20, Acts 8, 37, and 1 John 5, 7, just to name a few. 6. It's believed that Sinaticus has been altered by as many as 10 different men. Consequently, it's a very sloppy piece of work, probably the reason for it ending up in a trash can. And many transcript errors, such as missing words and repeated sentences, are found throughout it. 7. 
the Dutch scholar Erasmus, 1469-1536, who produced the world's first printed Greek New Testament, rejected the readings of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. 8. Vaticanus and Sinaiticus no longer agree, not only, not only disagree, with the majority text. I'll read that again to be sure. Vaticanus and Sinaiticus not only disagree with the majority text from which the KJV came, they also differ from each other. In the four Gospels alone, they differ over 3,000 times. Now when, this is point nine, when someone says that B and Aleph are the oldest available manuscripts, they are lying. If you've been a church referring to what's known as the original Greek, your preacher, your vicar, your pastor, your minister, whatever he calls himself, is a liar. They lied to me at Elam Bible College consistently. And they should return our fees, our monies, our expenses for calling it at that time a Bible college when the Bible was not opened once. There are many, continues James Melton, Syriac and Latin translations from as far back as the second century that agree with the King James readings. For instance, the Peshitta 145 AD, notice how much earlier it is to Vaticanus. And the old Syriac 400 AD, both contain strong support for the King James readings. There are about 50 extant copies of the old Latin from about 157 AD which is over 200 years before Jerome was conveniently chosen by Rome to revise it. Then Ophelus produced the Gothic version for Europe in AD 330. The Armenian Bible, which agrees with the King James, has over 1,200 extant copies and was translated by Mesrob around the year 400. Sanaticus and Vaticanus are certainly not the oldest and best manuscripts. You, my friends, are being constantly lied to in your churches. You, my friends, are being brainwashed consistently day after day and moment after moment. And to conclude tonight's course, surface, meeting, whatever we call it, we refer to the New Living Translation website that seeks to convince us of greater manuscripts than the received text. The NLT referring to Jesus as being like a God rather than the begotten Son of God. This is what the NLT website declares. The upshot of the 19th century and 20th century discoveries and publications a better Greek text, is that we now have a Greek text that is far more accurate than the Textus Receptus. Subsequently, English versions like the NLT that are based on the better Greek manuscripts are superior to the KJV, which is based on the Textus Receptus. You are lying bastards. A bastard is someone in the English, a biblical word, that describes people without a father. The Bible declares that those who take out and put in have their names no longer in the book of life. Hence they are without a father. So those of you who think I'm using sweary words are better get to learn the English language. A bastard is someone without a father. And these are bastard texts you've been reading in your church if it's an NIV, RSV, NASB, ASB, Message, NKJV. How many more are there, Lindsay? NLT, ESV, loads of them. In answer to the NLT's blasphemous website, one simply has to ask if it's better manuscripts are better than the manuscripts used by KJV translators then why is it that the KJV has identified 
Jesus as the Son of God rather than being like a God? The answer being the NLT has its origins in a city famous for its endeavours in trying to remove the deity of Jesus. That city is Alexandria, Egypt. And only the Son of God can set you free from its bondage. Although I am sorry to say, those responsible for this evil work, the Bible clearly says, have their names taken out of the book of life. Father, we come in the name of Jesus. And we're here tonight in Jesus' name to declare the victory of the Lord. And in these days of apostasy, in these days where when you preach these things, one is treated as an extremist, Father, we repent not for being extremists, for we are extremists for the true word of God, thy perfect word, which thou hast preserved through generation after generation. But this generation, Father, has not seen thy true word. And it's our prayer, Father, that we see a manifestation of thy spirit coming upon the preaching of thy word, that we will witness an end-time revival in these two years, this two-year pocket we clearly have, to reach the world with the gospel. Lindsay's coming to sing now. There is a river. This is about the Spirit of God falling upon His Word and the preaching of His Word. Smith Wigglesworth, a KJV man, declaring that in the very last of the last days, the Spirit and the true Word of God would come together. And this is our prayer as Lindsay comes and sings. There is a river that flows from deep within, a fountain that frees the soul from sin. Come to this water. Will you come to this water tonight in the name of Jesus? Thank you, David. This is so important. You know, there's so much brainwashing and bewitchment around at the moment. And Jesus said, Remember he said, watch and pray, be alert. Look for the signs of the times. Watch and pray. And here is the wonderful song. There is a river. Be refreshed today. There are times of refreshing in this song. Tells Just bear of with me, Lindsay. I'm getting the here track ready. Have we got the orchestra ready? Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> It's hilarious. <laughs> Look, I'm getting the CD on. You just bear with me now. It's coming. It's coming. Be patient. We are a remnant. We've got oh, remnant yeah. equipment as well, <laughs> exactly dear right. viewers and listeners. We are. We are. We're coming. We're getting it together now. There is a river. Praise the Lord. And you can come to this Savior today in amen, Jesus' mighty amen. name. Came a sound from heaven. It was like a mighty rushing wind. It filled their hearts with singing. And gave them peace within the prophet gave his promise. He said, The spirit we Oh! 
Bye, dear viewers and listeners. Till next time, God bless you. Remember, watch and pray. Stay awake. Look for the times, the signs of the times. Amen. <laughs>